how fun. Another long haul flight. How nice it is, for those of us at the back of the bus. No matter where on the aircraft you sit, long haul flights can be pretty testing. Quite literally, you are going to experience being temperature tested, humidity tested, pressure tested, and even tested at varying levels of background radiation. And, because I was flying with American Airlines, I even had my patience thoroughly tested as well. First, I should introduce the radiation detectors. I am traveling with three different detectors, which all use fundamentally different technologies. Firstly, I took the Radia Code 102 device. This is a gamma ray spectrometer, based around a cesium iodide scintillation crystal. This is my go-to device for portable measurements. Personally, I think it looks a little bit like a blood glucose monitor, but the TSA guys didn't believe me when I tried to cut the line, by claiming that I urgently needed to take an insulin shot. Apparently, I was not the first person to try this, and the TSA are now very familiar with the Radia Code product. I have already reviewed this excellent product, and a link to that video is in the description below. Next, is the Bosian FS5000. This is a basic Geiger counter, meaning it uses a Geiger Muller tube as the detection element. This is a very low-cost Chinese product, but that said, in this class of device, it is easily the best one that I have ever tested. Again, there is a link to my review of this product below. And finally, there is the RAM1. This is a new type of device based around a cadmium zinc telluride sensor. This is a compact and low cost personal dosimeter with a very long battery life. I have not made a review video for this product, and frankly I won't be wasting my time to make one either. As you will see during this video, it is a horrible piece of shit, that is almost totally incapable of performing any kind of radiation detection. The only reason I brought this device on this trip, was that it literally arrived at my door, just a couple of hours before I departed. So I didn't have any time to test it. Anyway, let's talk about why the background radiation is higher at altitude. Our Earth is constantly being bombarded with cosmic rays, which are at energy levels that are so staggeringly high, that none of my detectors are capable of directly measuring them. Some of these high energy cosmic rays will interact with our upper atmosphere. These interactions will often result in a cascade of further interactions, as the massive energy from the primary cosmic ray, is gradually dissipated over successive collision events. Photons and particles of many different kinds, will be emitted from these interactions with our atmosphere, and these are detectable. One such particle, is the elusive, and short-lived muon. Most of this, radioactive rain, will then be absorbed by further interactions in the thicker lower atmosphere. And then, along comes an aircraft, flying at almost the perfect height, to allow it to bathe in this radiation at its peak dose rate. Actually, the peak dose rate occurs at around 60,000 feet, which is at the same altitude that Concorde flew at. The reason for this, is that above 60,000 feet, cosmic rays have lower interaction with the thinner atmosphere. But below this, our atmosphere is progressively absorbing this cosmic ray debris. As an engineer who has actually worked in the aerospace industry, I am a fairly nervous passenger. Interestingly, most aerospace engineers are too. There is something quite disconcerting in knowing too much about the complex and interacting systems that allow 200 tons of stuff to take flight. Yes, almost everything has redundancy built in, but there are things that just can't have that, things like, the wings. 
So, when sat on an aircraft, trying my very hardest to look as relaxed as possible, I find it helps to take my mind off things like gremlins and the effects of gravity, by engaging in some experiments, like measuring the background radiation. So, let's talk about those background radiation measurements. The first leg of my trip was from Hong Kong to Tokyo. Most of this flight was at an altitude of 40,000 feet. And the flight took just over 4 hours. The dose rates recorded by the radio code and the FS5000, were significantly different. Obviously, we can completely ignore the RAM-01 device, it didn't respond in any way to the elevated background radiation. So why did two decent quality detectors, significantly disagree on the background levels? You remember that elusive muon flux, well these particles have a half-life of around 2.2 microseconds, and when they decay, electrons are produced. In other words, beta radiation, which is something that the radio code cannot detect. But the FS5000 can. So, over the first leg of my flight, According to the FS5000 device, the background radiation was between 2 and 2.5 microsieverts per hour. I am pretty sure, that some people will be wanting to know what the background level was in Tokyo. I can only speak for the airport, but the background levels were actually lower, than at Hong Kong, where I boarded this flight. The next leg of my journey was from Tokyo to Dallas. This was the longest and most boring part of my trip. Twelve and a half hours strapped to a chair and being forced to endure a hostile environment. Just think, we actually pay for this privilege. I didn't manage to collect all of the data from this leg of the trip, perhaps I fell asleep, or maybe I was busy counting the number of rivets that hold the wing to the aircraft body, and calculating their combined tensile strength. In any case, there is a lot of missing data from this trip to Dallas. What I did notice, was a slight increase in the background levels, as we approached the continental United States. At one point the levels peaked at 5 microsieverts per hour. It might be a complete coincidence, but at about the same time, and for the same duration, there was a minor solar flare, so perhaps an increase in the X-ray and gamma radiation was detectable. The radio code also saw an increase in the levels at the same time. Whilst flying over the United States, I did get a rather splendid view of the Rocky Mountains. When you look up at the night sky, you see photons that have traveled across the cosmos, ending their long journey across the void, within your very eye. But these are merely photons, an ethereal, non-corporal, packet of information. These busy little photons, have no concept of time, they undergo infinite time dilation. Seen from the point of view of a photon, every journey, no matter the distance, happens instantaneously. Cosmic rays on the other hand, are mostly protons. These are real, and solid entities, just like you or I. But unlike any human, many of these tiny travelers, have traversed intergalactic space, and found their way to our tiny blue dot. And this, is what fascinates me about taking measurements on a plane. It is possible to measure these secondary cosmic rays at sea level, but because the lower atmosphere has already absorbed most of the energy, the remaining secondary cosmic rays are drowned out by the general background radiation. But up in a plane, most of the particle clicks will be the greetings from these intergalactic travelers. And, in a nice twist of fate, it is the cheaper Geiger counters that are better at measuring them. So, next time you are facing a long and boring flight, you could always take a Geiger counter, and tune into our intergalactic guests. And then we come to this thing. This device should not be on the market. 
It's like they fiddled the firmware to read about 100 nanosieverts per hour, and then randomly flick up and down by one increment, to make it look like it is actually doing something. Unless a strong source is placed in direct contact with the device, right next to the location of the CZT sensor, the product will just display its fake background level. It's a shame, because cadmium zinc telluride is a really promising technology, it has the potential to be able to create gamma ray spectrometers, that have really impressive spectral resolution. I'm going to hang on to this thing for a bit longer, and learn some more about how it works. Perhaps there is some way to make a working device using this sensor. Anyway, that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed my little video, or at least found some parts of it interesting. If you want to see more of this kind of video, you could always press the subscribe button. This is not a commercial channel, nor will it ever be, so I can say what I want, and YouTube's algorithm can go and get f***ed. Thank you for your time.